Well, the passage that we have read must rank as one of the saddest records in the annals of human history. The downfall, the fall and downfall of Judas Iscariot. Judas had been with Jesus, followed his master wherever he went for three years as a disciple, nay, as an apostle, no less. He attended the preaching of Christ. He sang praises to God. He went with Christ to the house of God. He performed miracles. He engaged in prayer. In short, he was the model professing Christian. He did all the right things that you would expect a Christian to do. And very likely he would have devoted himself in private prayer and devotions. He would have read the Bible if that was available to him. Alas, it was all an outward profession of faith and not an inward possession of Christ. He did all the right things that no one ever suspected him, even at this late hour when he was about to betray Christ. His was a formal Christianity. Is your Christianity a formal Christianity? Because there are many who have a mere form of religion, and if this could happen in the most in the most circle of disciples, one should not be surprised at all if there are such people in church today, even in this church perhaps, that such people should exist amongst the ministers and office bearers and members should not surprise us at all. So let a man or a woman examine himself to see if they be in the faith. Prove your own selves. Yes, how many of men and women who have never absented themselves from public means of grace, never missed their private devotions in case their consciences are seared, and yet the exceptional Christian or the exemplary hypocrite because the worship they offer is all a formality, going through the motions without the emotion, the art of religion without heart religion. True religion is more than notion. Something must be known and felt. Yes, there are sadly false ministers and office bearers who are hypocrites to the bone. And often they play the cards so well that they deceive, they deceive many others, and often themselves. It's not what you profess merely, but what you practice that validates your profession. Practice is the result of our profession. And if you and I were to practice lawlessness, it is because we are outlaws. A good tree can only produce good fruit. The last, Judas was no good tree, but out of him came the most evil of fruits, the betrayal of our Lord Jesus Christ. Mark the lamentation of Christ himself concerning Judas. It was thou, a man mine equal, my guide, my acquaintance, we took sweet counsels together and walked unto the house of God in company. And how many of us have sweet counsels and fellowship with each other? And yet, yet this is no guarantee that we are all saved if it is merely an external, formal religion. So again, let a man or a woman examine himself or herself, see if he be in faith and not a Judas. Our Lord in the upper room had offered Judas a morsel, a piece of bread, 
which was high honor indeed. But that offering was a symbol, symbolic of an appeal to Judas, his final appeal to repent. John 13, 26, Jesus answered, He it is to whom I shall give a sop when I have dipped it. He it is who will betray me. Jesus was declaring, Judas, I know what you are about to do, but you can turn back. As the Lord enables, we shall concentrate again our minds on these sober words in John 13, 27. John 13, 27. And after the sob, Satan entered into him. Then said Jesus unto him, That thou doest, do quickly. After the sob, Satan entered in. Firstly then, the surrender of Judas. The surrender of Judas. After three years with the Lord, after the sob, Satan entered into him. Before the sob, Satan could not enter into Judas because Judas had created some resistance. Before the sob, Judas was on mercy's ground. Before the sob, Judas had every opportunity to repent, to turn back. He could cry unto God to have mercy and he would have been heard. Judas could come to the Lord in repentance and be safe, for he will in no wise cast out those that came before him. Now it is true that this promise is conditional upon the Father giving Christ all that shall come to him. We read in chapter 6, 37 of John. All that the Father giveth me shall come to me, and him that cometh to me I will in no wise cast out. But we cannot use the doctrine of election or of predestination to define our conduct. We cannot say that since we are not elect, that it is pointless to repent and to believe because we really do not know who the elect of God is. And so ironically, those who would abuse the word of God who have the audacity to misuse it prove perhaps that, that they are indeed not the elect. You and I are not to second guess God's prerogative, but you and I have a duty to repent of our sins. And yes, it was prophesied in the Psalms that there would come one who would betray Christ, that his habitation would be desolate, that his bishop Craig would be taken from him. That such a prophecy must be fulfilled is a certainty because the word of God is sure and steadfast. For the word of God is sure and steadfast. But that such a prophecy should be fulfilled because of necessity does not logically follow. Because it was not necessary for Judas to let Satan in. It was not necessary for Judas to surrender himself and allow Satan to come in. But after the sob, it was all too late. And after the sob, Satan entered into him. And so in the upper room, Judas was presented with an ultimatum, one final appeal. But sadly, as we know, he refused. And with this rejection, Judas crossed the Rubicon sometime before and after the stop. And there is only a thin, thin line between these two events, a small point separating the two. And now, as you know, that many folks in, who are near death and on the brink of eternity could not and would not seek after God. Because years ago, when they were young, and when they were younger, when they were exactly your age, when they were listening to the gospel message, like you are today, they say to themselves that repentance can wait. The sins of youth is too much to for 
for, for, to give up. Because there is always a time of repentance, they say to themselves, and yet unknown to them, unseen by them, sometime in their youth or adulthood, that they cross that line of no return. There is a time you know not when, a point you know not where, that marks the destiny of man to glory or despair. There is a line unseen by us that crosses every path, the hidden boundary between God's patience and his wrath. And for Judas, it was that very night that he crossed that line, that hidden mysterious boundary between God's patience and his wrath. He did not see it coming. He could not have expected it to be so soon. Do you expect to cross that line, that boundary today? And you cannot see, you cannot know where this boundary is. And all who goes beyond that boundary will be lost and lost forever. Are you still not alarmed, not afraid that you might be so very near the boundary, this boundary? that marks every man? Oh, where is this mysterious bond by which your path is crossed, beyond which God himself had sworn that he who goes is lost? Satan had been gnawing at the door of, of the heart of Judas for these three long years during the ministry of Christ. Day after day he nipped at the door, at first, Judas was steadfast. He had just been chosen as one of the twelve, and how exciting, what a tre tremendous privilege that was. He had heard the greatest preacher, and he was moved by that preaching. He was deeply affected. He was engulfed in, with the majesty and glory of Christ. He had seen the brightness of that glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. He who is the image of the invisible God, the effulgence of his glory, the express image of his being, was walking side by side Judas. When he touched Christ, he touched glory in the palm of his hand. When he saw Christ, he saw a glimpse of infinity in an hour. But all this meant nothing to Judas. And so, at first, he resisted the nibbling of the great adversary. But as you know, without the help of the Holy Spirit, there can be only one fatal outcome. Judas at first gave a little inch. It was merely a suggestion from Satan, which he easily brushed aside. And then it became seductive, and finally submissive. Finally, Satan succumbed to the lies of Satan and let Satan in. He opened the door of his heart, not to, Je not to Jesus Christ, but to Satan. And then the devil took control. He was appointed the keeper of the purse but disregarded all the warnings of Jesus Christ against greed and hypocrisy. He had left the door of his heart ajar a little because of his greed and his love of money. And it was at first a tiny opening, but it was enough for Satan to have a foothold. And once Satan had a foothold, he could not get rid of Satan. And isn't this how declension and backsliding sets in? All those who have backslidden, who have become apostate, never ever planned in the early days to do so. The end result was never their intention. The scenario is played over and over again, and yet we are not any the wiser. 
The people of God are surrounded by the ungodly all around us. And all their ungodly practices. And you once recoiled with abhorrence at heresy and sin. You are antagonistic. And then you become apathetic. You become indifferent to them. By and by, you find a place in your heart. You accommodate sin and heresy. You tolerate them. And soon you become to admire sin, maybe from a distance initially. Finally, you assimilate them into your thinking. Antagonism, apathy, accommodation, admiration, assimilation, regression into sin and declension. And church history teaches us that church history repeats itself. And if there's one lesson to be learned, surely it is this. You must nip in the bud heresy and sin before the nip becomes your buddy. Sure, it was a slow process of three years to the top of sin, but once the pinnacle is reached, the drop is almost instantaneous. The surrender of Judas to Satan. And that resulted, secondly, in the selling of Jesus. The selling of Jesus was not merely an act of treachery, but for he sold Jesus for a paltry 30 pieces of silver because he had sold himself, firstly, to the power of evil. And that would be the epitaph if he had a gravestone. And that's the epitaph of all the gravestones of unbelievers you will find in the cemeteries. I have found thee because thou hast sold thyself to the work to work iniquity, to work evil in the sight of the Lord. And that will be your epitaph no matter how respected you are, respected respectable you are in society, or how high a office position you hold in church. Selling spiritual assets and privileges is always a sign of wickedness. And that's why selling occurs predominantly, predominantly in the unjust and the wicked. Sometimes it, selling it occurs in the Christian in his backslidden state. Because selling is a sign of declension and always a sin. And every declension, every backsliding can be traced to the selling of spiritual blessings. Why are we so poor spiritually today? And why is the church so poor? Why are the pews so empty? For the same reason that men are poor, instead of in, in investing in their heirloom, they sell the family heirloom first chance that they have. And so we have sold our time to unprofitable activities. We have sold our faithfulness. We have sold our discipline and zeal and commitment, our Christian heritage and our traditions. Now we follow traditions not for tradition's sake. That was the fatal mistake of the Pharisees and they were soundly condemned. But there are traditions we must maintain. Indeed, as the Apostle Paul warns us, that you withdraw yourselves from every brother that walketh disorderly, and not after the tradition which he received of us. It is traditional to attend all the public means of grace. It is traditional for all of his bearers to be faithful when they subscribe to the confessions of the church. But how loose is our church attendance and how loose is our subscription? We've been selling all our faithfulness. There's a lot of selling going on in the professing church and it does not bode well for the future. Churches, the national church being a prime example, have sold the Christian heritage and their traditions. They have sold the truth and let's change it for a lie. And that's why they are so uh, bankrupt, so morally, spiritually bankrupt. 
we are to hold fast the form of sound doctrine because selling the truth is selling Jesus who is the truth and every truth which is our heritage that had been so carefully secured through the century, centuries often drenched with the blood of martyrs must be guided there can be no via media or middle road in theology there's no place in church for pyronism that is the philosophy that suspends judgment that withholds belief that accepts things as they are avoids controversies and so on but we must be firm in the holding the truth and the traditions that we have inherited and our church is poor our pews are empty because the covenant children brought up in church despise the upbringing have been selling that Christian upbringing and how many of the ministers even children of the ministers even of office bearers have sold themselves have sold their birthright the right to gospel privileges like you saw for a mo for a morsel just to satisfy their carnal appetites for the moment parents have you sold your responsibilities to bring up children in the fear and admonition of god and every church member who fails in his duty to pray for the children baptized not into families but into gods are in some sense selling the children into the world they're selling the future of the church they're selling the gospel selling is the hallmark of wickedness contrast that with a believer who's work, walking closely with the lord he always buys and sells not that's why he grows spiritually richer day by day he accumulates all the spiritual blessings in heavenly places he buys the truth and sells it not also wisdom and instruction and understanding well you have to ask yourself this morning are you buying or are you selling today are you selling your principles principles because it's too difficult are you planning to sell your christian upbringing for a morsel of what the world offers are you selling your soul to the lowest bidder from the lowest depths of hell what does it profit you if you shall gain the whole world but lose your own soul or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul the sabbath day is called quite rightly the market day of the soul it is not a market day where we can exchange in vain gossip or in secular business our business today is with almighty god it's called the market day of the soul because it is the day where you replenish your depleted spiritual stock there are evil days ahead of us and to withstand the onslaught of the evil we have to be prepared in this market day of the soul there is no selling and buying and exchanging of goods but only buying and how much you buy depends on how long you spend in this blessed market day if you were to attend both services on this day it is only one percent of your entire life one percent of your life is spent in uh, in the sabbath services how much time do you think you can possibly buy how much truth can you possibly buy during this one percent the word of god is a deep great deep the commandments are exceeding broad and we cannot in one hour or two plunge the depths and mind the breath of the truth that is in the word of god and if this are just just two hours in church is all that you spend in spiritual exercises then you are of all men most miserable but buying thank god is not confined to the public services of the church or to the market day 
of the soul. You can have your own private devotions and meditating on the Word of God. You can read and study what others have read and studied in the form of a good, solid, sound Christian book. It was the tradition in Scotland to have, besides the Bible, the Shorter Catechism, the Pilgrim's Progress, and Thomas Boston's Fourfold State. It was a tradition for them to read. Now, it is true that we ought to read and meditate upon the Bible, but sometimes there are passages that are so difficult for us to understand and us poor, ordinary, humble Christians realizes that he doesn't have all the answers and all the resources and skills to un understand the Bible. And so he looks to another God has raised up, blessed with these skills, that they may be able to expound the scriptures more clearer. And when you read a book, you're not just reading the work of the author who has spent a few years of his life or even his entire life composing that book, you are reading 2,000 years of Christian scholarship because that author would have read the church fathers, who studied the Puritans, who researched reformers, who surveyed the post-Nicene fathers, who perused the Nicene fathers. 2,000 years of Christian scholarship crystallized and distilled in a form that you can understand with little effort. 2,000 years in the palm of your hands. They, let, they read all the Latin tomes so you don't have to. They poured their heart and soul in prayers to understand and mastering Greek and Hebrew. And yours is just to take a book and read for yourself in the comfort of your armchairs. You can buy these truths that have been purified over centuries of controversy. They shed their blood, they shed their sweat and their tears to present to the church compendium of truths, precious truths. And how becoming of us to shed tears at the thought of reading them? Yes, the lost tradition of reading Christian classics by the truth today, be it in a in a sermon, in the Bible, in book form, buy and sell not, especially in this blessed market day of the soul. Do business with God and enrich yourselves because our church is becoming poorer and poorer because someone is selling Jesus. Well, Judas sold Jesus for 30 pieces of silver Men have sold Jesus for less. And Satan must have thought that there was his greatest achievement to get rid, together with the enemies of Christ, this, this uh, wine bibber, enemies and friends of sinners. What a shock to him if he were to hear the words echoed in his diabolical years. But as for you, Satan, you thought evil against me, but God meant it unto good. To bring to the pass, as it is this day, to save much people alive, the salvation of much people. Thirdly, the saving of the just. The saving of the just. Our Lord had prophesied what Jesus would do, that thou doest do quickly. Judas would soon do that which he was compelled to do quickly. That was a prophecy of Jesus. And prophets and prophecy presupposes sin. It is because of sin that there are prophets and prophecies. The first prophecy in the Bible was in response to sin. The first prophet in the Old Testament, seventh from Adam, warned of judgment against upon the ungodly. The first prophet in the New Testament warned his hearers to repent. And wherever and whenever there is declension in the land of Judah and Israel, God raised up prophets. He sent one of his prophets in the time of Mount Declension, departure from himself. Today, 
is a time of marked declension, and Scotland is a land where there is departure from God. Now the prophetic officer ceased, replaced by the minister of the gospel. But where is that prophetic voice in churches today? Where is the, where are the, why are the pulpits so empty? Why is there no prophetic voice warning sinners to flee from the wrath to come? This judgment beginning already begun in the church of God. Judgment begins in the house of God. Then Jesus said unto him that thou doest, do quickly. That which Judas must do, he must do quickly, so that, Je so that what Jesus must do, he must do quickly. And that's the salvation of the church of God, which he had purchased with his own blood. Our Lord suffered the indignation of being sold, that he might purchase with his own blood the likes of you and I who would come to him by faith. For once we were carnal, soul under sin. And so Christ was sold as a lamb, led like a lamb to the slaughter, that his blood might be, might be shed. And those who are sold under sin must be brought under God with blood. Why blood? Because of sin. Yes, when we read the Bible, see grace and bless emblazoned prominently across the pages of scripture yes there's mercy and truth and loving kindness being the recurring theme but that is precisely because sin was and is so prevalent in the lives of men and women first death recorded in the bible was because of sin adam fell and must pay for for his fall with his life. Blood is our life. Without it, we cannot live. And a man who sins must die, must shed his blood to pay for his sin. The blood that maketh an atonement for the soul. Without the shedding of blood is no remission. The wonder of grace is the truth that Christ shed his blood for every sinner who repents and believes on him. For the sinner must pay with his own blood unless he can find a substitute who is willing to shed his blood and take his place as his substitute. The first animal death recorded illustrates this. The blood that was shed, the skin used as a covering. For the life of the flesh is in the blood, and I have given it to you upon the altar to make an atonement for your souls. For it is the blood that maketh an atonement or cover for the soul. Christ our substitute. Now that's a theme we would do well to meditate upon. Westminster Confession chapter 8. The Lord Jesus by his perfect obedience and sacrifice of himself, which he through the eternal spirit once offered up unto God, hath fully satisfied the justice of his Father, and purchased not only reconciliation, but an everlasting inheritance in the kingdom of heaven for all those whom the Father had given unto him. Christ, our substitute. So Judas sold Jesus. But wait so that our Lord could buy redemption. For as much as you know that you were not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold, but with the precious blood of Christ, as of a lamb without blemished and without spot. The wonder of grace. The one soul as a slave is the only one who could buy slaves, who could buy redemption for slaves. We have been bought with a price. Do we repay Christ by selling what he has shed with his precious blood? What would you give in exchange for his precious blood? So, I want the name of that boy, and I want the name of that girl 
who has made plans to sell the covenant privileges and the Christian upbringing and the instructions that they have received, who intends to sell all the prayers that Father prayed and all the tears Mother shed and all the anguish and the sleepless nights and the agonizing and wrestling with God, so that we may commend them to God, so that we may yet again plead tenderly and pray earnestly for them who would not plead and pray for themselves. And I want the name of that man, and I want the name of that woman who Sabbath after Sabbath, year after year, attend church and yet have not bought an iota of truth, entering through those doors, but never entering through that door which is Christ, who is declared, I am the door by me, if any man enter in, he shall be saved, shall go in and out and find pasture, so that their names may be before the church, so that supplications may be made in their behalf, on their behalf, and lacrimation may be shed in their state, that they may reconsider their path and be reconciled to God. How long can you delay coming to Christ in repentance? How far may you go on in sin? How long will God forbear? Where does hope begin? Where does hope end? And where begin the confines of despair? An answer from the skies is sent, Ye that from God depart, while it is called today, repent and not harden your heart. And I want the names of all those of us all, lukewarm, neither cold nor hot, professing Christians who have stopped buying the truth, and remind ourselves that Christ has somewhat against us because we have left our first love. But repentance brings encouragement. As many as I have loved, I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous therefore and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come in to him and will sup with him and he with me. Why spend money on that which is not bread? and labour for that which does not satisfy. O those who are thirsty, thirsty for the fame and fortune and favour of the world, anyone, everyone that thirsted, come ye to the waters, and he that hath no money, come ye, buy and eat. Ye come, buy wine and milk without honey, without money, and without price. Buy of him gold tried in the fire, that thou mayest be rich, and white raiment, that thou mayest be clothed. Amen.